first. Yes. And for what? For two rocks. To enter the lock. Oh, for, for, for the lock. It's not my fault. Yes, it is. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, honey. Here I got my little text. So, afterwards, I'm going to repeat this in the YouTube group for those of you who did not know that. Because we'll have fun. Anyway, have a great class. Welcome. You might want to check the gym later. Okay, there we go. Thank you, guys. That was that was fun. But we are going to be doing some cool stuff here pretty soon. We've got the lock-in coming up. That's coming up uh, next weekend. And the, the lock-in is going to be a lot of fun. we got a lot of stuff planned. We're going to have a little worship time. We're going to have some games. We're going to have make your own pizza like we did that one night. That was a lot of fun. Um, uh, and then we're going to, that next morning, we're doing a service project. We're making breakfast for the men's breakfast. So this will be a lot of fun. Cool. We're going to get up and we're going to make breakfast for the men. And I would like for us to do some kind of like a testimony. If you guys want to tell uh, this generation, this older generation, like me. I hate them. Quite old generation. Well, well thank you for quite old You're generation. You're not going to be here. I know I'm old and all, but that's what I'm going to be here that weekend. You want to be, apparently. <laughs> 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 but anyway, we're, uh, we're going to have fun at, at that. We're going to do, the, that's going to be a service project. And like I said, guys, we, guys, we've been doing really well with our fundraisers. So we're going to do some fun stuff. So again, I want you all to be thinking about some ideas of things you can suggest to Robin or myself or Cassidy or Mandy about where we can go on a fun trip, you know, someplace that we can go do something really cool because we're going to, we're going to look at doing some really fun things as well. Um, the Seder. Who's heard what a Seder is? Anybody know what that is? Anybody heard what a Seder is? Like half man, half horse? Ah, that's a satire or a satire. But yes, spelled differently. Uh, Seder is in the Jewish tradition. The word literally means order. And um, what? basically what it is, is who's heard of the uh, the Last Supper? When Jesus gave the Last Supper? Who heard? Okay, great. That's most of us. Do you know that was a Seder meal? It was a traditional Jewish meal to celebrate something called the Passover. Now, the Passover... Is something very special that we need to kind of get a grip on, because that was the last plague that that the Egyptians. Yes. Had to do with it. Mm -hmm. Yes, because th that's one of the anniversaries of Passover, and that's even though that's the, one of the major anniversaries of Passover, that's where we get the term Passover. Do you know that date is not the first time mentioned in history? It's actually mentioned in the Bible that on the anniversary in advance of Passover, that's when Noah's flood. Was, had ceased. That's when all the water started to recede. That's the birth of new life for Noah and us, his, his descendants, on that very day. So God works in what we call prophecy. Who knows, who knows what a prophecy is? Who can tell me what a prophecy is? What is it? Uh, basically a prediction. Absolutely. Prediction? Absolutely. That's the come. Okay. So, so a prediction that will happen. It's what happens with the prediction. It has to be accurate to be a prophecy. Because if I say I prophesy, you know, that uh, I'm going to be a millionaire tomorrow and it doesn't happen, I'm not much of a prophet, am I? A false prophet. Yeah, I'm a false prophet. So, but in this day and age, that happens quite a bit. We just call that person a hypocrite or a liar and we move on. But in the, in the old days, in the Jewish culture, in the Old Testament culture, if you were a prophet and you said, I'm coming from God and God told me to tell you this. And that thing didn't come exactly true. They didn't sit there and point the finger at you and call you a liar. They killed you. They killed you. They stoned you. And that stoning is a slow and painful death. So, you, And you didn't get a chance to get it right the next time. You got it right every time or you were dead. Now, prophecy in our Western way of thinking is a little bit different than what the Jewish people used to think. See, we think of a prophecy as one and done. Okay, here's the prophecy... Here's the fulfillment. Bingo. We can chalk that up as one and done. But that's not the way the Jewish people look at it. Prophecy is repetition. It's repeatability. It's like when God gives us the promise uh, in Genesis that everything repeats and everything it reproduces according to its kind. That's a prophecy. Because God has said this is what's going to happen and it's always going to happen that way. And what do we see? 
We see it happening that way all the time. Same thing is true with God's Word and when He says things are going to happen. Did you know, when we look at this picture here, this is a picture of the triumphal entry when Jesus comes into Jerusalem riding humbly on a donkey. Okay? So, this happened to fulfill a prophecy. A prophecy written in the book of Daniel. And that book of Daniel not only said, well, the Messiah is going to come in to this particular city in this country. That book of Daniel says that Messiah is going to come in on a specific day and only in this specific way, riding on this donkey, and they're going to be singing these particular songs when he does it. And Daniel prophesied that to happen to the day, and you can actually take and do the calculations to the day that Jesus rode in, that donkey into Jerusalem. Over 300 years before it happened, he prophesied it to the day. Now, again, we look at different calendars and things like that, and we understand that God's prophecies are perfect. They're true. They cannot be wrong. So we look at why Jesus did this. On this very same day, it's the, we have a, a calendar, and it's called a Gregorian calendar. And, and we have a different calendar than what the Jews use. The Jewish people, especially the Jewish people of that day, uh, they have different calendar names as well for their months. This would be, in the Passover season, would be the month of Nisan, or the first month of their religious calendar. And so... Every year, for 1,500 years before Jesus rides in on that donkey, for 1,500 years, every year, on the 10th of Nisan, they make the offering of what's called the Paschal Lamb, or the Sacrificial Lamb. So, every year, for 1,500 years, they're practicing offering up a perfect lamb on the 10th of Nisan, and that's when that happened, that particular event. So Jesus is the fulfillment of all these calendar events. But it comes back to this. Jesus died for sinners. And again, I asked you a minute ago about that two-minute gospel. What are you going to say to me, laying there dying of a heart attack? I got two minutes to live. What do you say? You, you know, you, you've been walking with me for a little bit. You know I'm not saved. You, you've been hearing me talk. You've been, you hear some of the things I talk about. Because again, the Bible says, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So I've been talking about all kinds of terrible things that aren't biblical. So you know I'm not a Christian. No doubt in your mind. Boom, I'm down on the floor. Grasping my heart, I'm going to go. You know it. There's no way the ambulance is getting here. What do you do? What do you say? Pray with them. But what do you say to somebody who doesn't believe? I'm right now still rejecting God, laying there on the ground. What do you do? That's see, a hard one. It is a tough one. But see, this is what we have to be prepared for. You know, I hope that never happens to anybody, that you come up on somebody laying in, a, in distress like that. I hope you never get to you know, have that happen to you. But the truth be told, that's happening to us every day. We just don't recognize it. You know what? I had a guy one time I used to work with, and slender guy, ran in marathons, and here I am, me. I don't run in marathons. The only time I run is going from the seat to the salad bar. That's it. But here's this guy. He's in peak condition. He's running marathons for miles. He's getting ready to, he's doing his stretching, getting ready to do a marathon. He's standing right next to a heart surgeon. He has a heart attack, collapses, and dies right there. Boom. No warning, no nothing. See, we're not promised another moment. And so when we look at somebody like that who we think might be healthy, they could have something that's going to take their life in a moment. Have you ever heard of news stories where kids, you know, in, in high school and middle school are playing basketball or playing some kind of uh, stuff and they're running down the court and next thing you know they collapse because they had something wrong with their heart. They had something wrong with their brain. They had an aneurysm. Boom. They're hit there one moment and gone the next. Why? 
What, what does that mean to us? What do we do with that? We have to look at everybody as though we're all in the same boat. <clears throat> and that's the, the Bible says, there but, the, there but for the grace of, well, that's not in the Bible. That's the saying about the Bible. There but for the grace of God, that would be me. If somebody hadn't shared the gospel with me, what if I died in that state of rejection? God has shown himself. God has shown mean? himself, exactly. So even though I would be rejecting God, I would still know that there's a God. I would have no excuse. But see, here's what, what you can do. You can pray with that person, but you can ask them some questions. Hey, I know you, you, you know you're going to die. You know you're, you're close to death. Do you know that you're a sinner? Do you know that you've lied? Everybody's lied. Do you know that you've stolen? Just admit it. And admit that there's a God that you know that can forgive you of your sins. That's how easy the gospel is. That there's one name under heaven by whom we all must be saved. That's Jesus Christ. So, Jesus died for sinners. He came to Jerusalem to die on the cross for sinners. And this was not something he thought of on the fly. This is like, well, maybe I need to do this and I'll go this. Or, well, maybe I need to fulfill, fulfill that. No, he had this all lined out from the moment of creation. Our God is so awesome that he knew everything that needed to happen to make every other thing happen to make sure his plan of ultimate righteousness for those who will accept him will be fulfilled. That's our God. What happens? What happened when Jesus was crucified? A lot of things. A lot of things. What was it? It was the ultimate sacrifice. It was the ultimate sacrifice. Why? Because he was the perfect human being. The perfect human being. That's right. He did. He was born just like we were all born, except a little bit different. Because he was not born of a man. He was born of the Holy Spirit. He, he had a mother, but he was not born um, in a natural way. He was born in a supernatural way. That, again, once again, proving who he is, that he is God. But I want you to think about something. Jesus lived a perfect life for 33 years that you and I can't live for 33 seconds. Now, and you've heard me say this before. As Christians, we're called not to be sinners. We're called to go and sin no more. If you love me, obey my commands. That's what Jesus says. We're called not to be sinners. And yet I just said that we can't even go 33 seconds without breaking the laws of God. Even on our best days, we fall short. But all this can bring us down to where, oh man, we can't do it. But I want you to remember one verse that Christ tells us. And this is so cool. That we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And one of those all things is, is we can stand up to our sin nature. We can stand up to the temptations that we face every day. Because Christ gave us that power to do so. But I want you to not only think about what happened when he gave that sacrifice... But I want us to think about what happened physically. There's a word that we use. I mean, it's not used a whole lot. It's used in, in, in some literature. It's called excruciating. Have you ever heard of that word? That word literally means out of the cross. Because crucifixion was such a horrific way of dying that they had to create a new word to describe it. So I want you to think about something. The God who created trees is going to allow himself to be nailed to a tree. The God who created blood is going to allow his perfect blood to be shed to cover our sins. Now, some people will say, and again, you know me, I, I love to talk about the argumentation that atheists and other non-believers will throw at you. They'll say, well, golly, he was God. He could have just turned off his pain sensors and he wouldn't have had to you know, listen to any of that or hear any of that or feel any of that. Because, hey, he's God. He could do that stuff. But, what but, he chose to. To. but he chose to. Exactly. He chose to pay the price for us. What price is that? 
Why did Christ have to die? Mm. Because of me. Because of me. There was, when we go through and we start talking about the Passover feast and what happened during the Passion Week when Christ is taken before um, Pontius Pilate. And Pontius Pilate literally says, I find no fault in the man. He tries to get out. He tries to figure a way out of his predicament. He doesn't want to be a part of this. His wife has already told him, and women know some stuff. Let me go ahead and tell you that. Women know some stuff when it comes to bad situations. His wife has already told him, you don't want to be a part of this. This is not good. And so he's trying to get out. He knows that there's something not right here. And so he tries to do the normal thing. Every year at Passover, they have what's called a prisoner exchange. They offer Barabbas as a prisoner exchange. This man is a known murderer, a known thief, a known um, zealot for rebellion. He was always trying to in install, uh, uh, instill a rebellion. So he's like, I'll give you this guy instead of this guy. I said, no, crucify Christ. Go ahead and let Barabbas, the known murderer, go. And Jesus, who did no wrong, no sin, no nothing, he died for us. That's part of the thing we got to remember, too, is not just the action of it, but why he came to do that. Because we can't do anything for ourselves. We can't pay the price for ourselves. You know, um, some of the pain that was endured through the cross, through the passion, you know, that Christ went through. Um, in, uh, I think it's in Isaiah, bless you, it talks about how um, through his stripes we have been healed. Um, when we start talking about some of the symbols in the Jewish culture, see, people think that the Jewish culture is different than the Christ Christian culture. Actually, it's not. We are grafted in. We are, we are one in the same. If the Jews have accepted, those Jewish people who have accepted Messiah, then they are what's called Messianic Jews. That means they're Christians. And us, as Christians, we know the Messiah has come because he came riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. His name is Jesus. You might also hear it pronounced Yahshua, or uh, Yeshua Mashiach. That's Jesus Messiah. You know what the word Jesus literally means? Yeshua actually means? God saves God saves. God saves. Can you imagine Mary hollering for Jesus when he needs to come in at night? God saves, come here. God saves, come here. But names are important because our names tell something about us. And there's another thing I want to talk about too, about how names in the Bible mean something. Jesus' name means something. Adam means something. Adam means man. So we're going to go through and talk about all the different history. We're going to talk about the, the Passover meal. We're going to talk about the Seder. But we're going to also talk about our memory verse. This is our memory verse for this month. And it's John chapter 11, verse 25. Everybody open up your Bible to John 11, verse 25. There you go, sir. There you go. There you go. Matthew, Mark, Luke, Leviticus, right? John. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Somebody was paying attention. Okay, we're looking at John chapter 11. Verse 25. Yeah, let's start at verse 17, though. You want to read it? Okay, well, I'll there. I will. There. Uh, the heading there is, I am the resurrection and the life. Now, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. 
Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Wow. Can you imagine... What happens when a body stops to function? It goes into rigor mortis. Rigor mortis? What's a, the, I guess, a technical term for that? What happens to the body overall? Every system in the body begins to shut down, decay, shut, to decompose. And, and so when you've got somebody who's been, been dead one day, probably don't smell. A couple days, eh. but four days, four days dead. That stinks. There's flies. Yeah, there's flies. So, Jesus does something in this particular verse that's really cool. He calls Lazarus out by name. He says, Lazarus, come out. Why do you think he called him by name? This is just my opinion because the Bible really doesn't tell us. So where it's, when it's my opinion, I'll be the first one to wave that flag and tell you this is my opinion. But it's my opinion that if Jesus had just said, come out, that every dead soul would have come out. Every dead person in that grave would have come out. Because that's what happens at Jesus' call. When, when Jesus calls, every knee will bow, every tongue confess. Everybody will stand before God in judgment. So uh, that's just my opinion on that. Uh, let's see here. Rising from the dead. Resurrection is rising from the dead, coming back to life. Now, we live in a scientific generation. Have we ever witnessed a resurrection? A true resurrection? No. <laughs> no. When we, when we hear people say, oh, um, I was dead for 45 seconds and I saw a light and a tunnel and this, that, and the other. Were they really dead? No. no. They still have a little bit of brain function left. That's right. That's right. Dead is clinically, physically dead and decomposing. Three days dead is dead. I mean, somebody can feign being dead. You can have your heart stop on you, and the next thing you know, you come back. But there's been people that have um, uh, had special uh, kind of genetic problems, and they would they would have a seizure that looked like death, and so it would rain in their family, and so they would have these special bells that they would have them buried with. That if this was part of their problem. They could actually tug the bell, and the bell would ring inside the tomb, and you would come and unbury the person. That's how this used to work. That's before they would actually do an autopsy and take your internal organs out and stuff like that. They, when they put you in the ground now, they know you're not coming out. But back then, they didn't know those things. So they did a lot of weird things. So, resurrection is, by definition, a miracle. We can't witness this. We can't even create one. So resurrection, coming back to life, is a miracle. So, and the reason I say all that is because in this day and age, people are going to tell you that life can just happen by itself. Well, wait a minute. The creation of life at all is a miracle. Whether it's coming back to life from the dead, that's obviously a miracle because we can't do that. And whether it's the creation of new life, that's obviously a miracle because we can't do that either. Only God can create life. Okay, let's go to Matthew chapter 21. Oh, what time is it, by the way? Oh, we got time. And um, we're going to be talking about when he starts coming into Jerusalem. Before we do that, let's go to Psalm 22. Psalm 22. Before we do that. You know, 
Uh, so it's uh, on page 457, Psalm 22. We're going to start at verse 1. I thought we were in Matthew. Well, we were, but I changed my mind. Wake up, Brad. Cool. I tend to change my mind every now and again. Old people can do that. It's not 1 o'clock yet. I still have to sleep. <laughs> okay. Now, I want you to think about this. We're going to be talking about the Psalms here. Um, and this Psalm was written by David. Psalmist, and it was written hundreds of years even before crucifixion was a way of execution. I want you to think about that for a second. That this was prophesied, that this would happen to Christ hundreds of years before people even figured out how to kill people this way. The very first verse, 22.1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so, so far from saving me? From my words of my groaning, oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Yet ye are, yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel, in you our fathers trusted, they trusted, and you delivered them. Let's see here. I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind, and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make uh, mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breast. On you was I cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Um, down at uh, verse 12. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a raving and roaring lion. I am poured out like water. All of my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt. And my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. Now, I want to talk about this one right here. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. The Bible talks about how the, the Passover lamb has to be the perfect, sinless lamb of God. And when Jesus comes to be baptized by John the Baptist, the very first thing that's said by John about Jesus Behold, the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. So we know that Jesus is being pointed to as the Paschal Lamb of God. But one of the things we have to, again, remember because of the Jewish culture, God was very specific that your offering, your, your uh, lamb offering, your sacrificial lamb, cannot have any broken bones. It has to be perfect. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Mm -hmm. That was when Jesus turned over the, t uh, the tables in the temple. That, we'll talk about that too because he was mad that they were stealing from the flock. They were stealing from his flock, his children, the children of God, uh, by, st by bringing in bad... Th well, actually, it was a circular thing. You would bring in your sheep and it would be perfectly fine, but the priest would say, oh, guess what? Your sheep has a blemish, so I need to sell you this sheep over here that they just bought from somebody else in the same way, but I have to take all your money when you do it, so... It was a racket. Yeah, it was a racket. So, none of his bones could be broken. That was a prophecy. Now, also, because of when this was happening, this was happening during, right before a Sabbath. So, a Sabbath was a sacred time in the Jewish culture. They did not want dead prisoners rotting on the Sabbath out there in the middle of the public to, to be seen. So, because the, the Roman guards didn't want to cause an uproar, they would generally break the legs of the prisoners so they would expire that day and they could take them off the crosses so they would not be hanging on the crosses during Passover. But Jesus, when they came to him, had already given up his ghost. That's what the Bible talks about, giving up his spirit. Now I want you to think about who's in control of all of this. Jesus is in control of when he rides in to Jerusalem to pronounce that he is the sacrificial lamb of God. He's in control of what music they're singing. He's in control of, of when he will be uh, offered as the sacrifice. 
on that day he gets put on the cross. And he's in control of the moment he dies. Because he says something that uh, the word is tetelestai. It's hard to pronounce tetelestai. But it literally means it is finished. It would be like if we had a, a bill and somebody took that bill with a big rubber stamp and said, paid in full. That's what that means. It is finished. Paid in full. And then he breathed his last. So he's in control of all things. Um, For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I count all my bones. They stare and gloat at me and divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. They gamble for his stuff. Now again, how do you manage to get yourself crucified and say, okay, guys, I'm up here and I'm trying to fulfill this prophecy. Would you mind gambling for my clothes? Thank you. Appreciate that. You think they're going to do that? No. No. Now, wait a minute. What's, what does something like this tell us about the Bible? When God can see something that's going to happen hundreds of years or maybe even thousands of years in advance, not only see that it's going to happen, but he predicts exactly how it's going to go down, who's going to do what, and when they're going to do it. So what do you think this tells us about this book? You think we can trust it? I think we can absolutely trust it. Because it's our solid foundation. Because when God says something, it's perfectly true. The Bible says, let every man be found a liar, but God be found true. Because if God isn't the absolute source of truth, you can't know anything to be true anyway. I've said that before. (coughs) But I just love that they're going through and they're doing exactly what the Bible says that they will do. They cast lots for us. Um, Garments. Uh, let's see, it's been the lion rescue yet. I tell the name of my brothers and this congregation. Uh, if you're the Lord, praise him. Okay, where was the other one I wanted to look at? Hmm. I don't remember now. Okay. But all of these scriptures in uh, Hebrews chapter 10, it points to that everything in the Bible is talking about Christ. Old Testament is pointing to Christ that's going to be in the New Testament. The New Testament is pointing to Christ and then points to him in the Old Testament. So we got validation of both of them. So now let's go to Matthew chapter 21. 21. And we may get one more verse. And the Malachi. Someone read that one for me. 21 uh, verses 1 and 2. I will. Okay, go ahead. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, when you came up to Bethphage, to the mount of olives, then Jesus sent to the disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Okay. Untie them and bring him to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. Excuse me, that's verse number five. So again, what they're referencing here is going back to the book of Daniel. And that book of Daniel was written hundreds of years before this event occurs. Now, so we know that's prophecy, but Christ is just telling these guys to go do something. And wait a minute. Go and do this. Here's what you're going to find. Go this. How did he know it was already there? Well, he's God. That's how he knows. Wait a minute. How does he know that somebody might ask him a question? How how does he know what to tell that person in order to get them to release the donkey so he can get done what he needs to get done? He's God. He's God. God. That's right. He knows all this stuff in advance. But again, he's not doing it for his benefit. He's doing that for our benefit. For us to look at this and look at the scripture and say, 
Oh, well. In order for him to know this stuff, he has to have a perspective that is outside of how our limited perspective works. So, just something to think about. Okay, guys, uh, I'm also going to have up here uh, one of these uh, prophetic death activities. This is, uh, it's really fun to talk about that. But these are all the places that, in the Bible, it talks about Jesus, the Messiah, dying. It was prophesied beforehand. It's prophesied. So I'm going to leave these out. If you want, we'll talk about these a little bit later when we get back. But let's uh, let's pray before we get out there today. Father God, we thank you. Lord, we thank you that you love us the way you do. We thank you that uh, you allow us to come together in fellowship. And Lord, as we uh, go out and uh, start to uh, be a part of, uh, of the congregation of your church, Father, uh, help us to pay attention to what's going on, what's being said. Help us to take good notes, Father, so we can ask good questions, so we can store up your word in our heart, so we can have that two-minute gospel for those people who are dying right next to us. Lord, we love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' holy name we pray. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Okay, guys. Be sure to take notes today.